Can you see them? Take my glass. Look down here from the church tower. We're at Newburn. The Fods and the River Tyne lie just below us. To 28th of August, 1640. And I am Alexander Leslie, Earl of Leven. I command the army of the Solemn League and Covenant. I may have 18,000 foot behind me, two and a half thousand horse, and as many guns as I can use. Below me, on the hoffs, across the slow, sluggish waters of the Tyne, are perhaps 3,000 English infantry under Lord Conway. And he has maybe uh, 1,500 cavalry and a few guns. But why are we here? Why is the Scottish army on the banks of the River Tyne in England? Well, you may thank our king, King Charles, for that. It is he who, through the ill advice of certain evil counsellors, has called this whole business into play. Not for the first time either. Now, King Charles is, of course, King of England. He's also King of Scots. I think he's only been here once, and that was six years ago. Didn't much care for it, played golf and went home. His father, James the Sixth, to bear that name, was a wily king, and he governed England and Scotland between them for 50 years. He died in his bed, too. That was an achievement. None of his predecessors had died peacefully, including his popish poor of a mother. But James, once he went south, rather lost interest in Scotland. He spent 30 years north of the border battling with a kirk for who should actually rule. Well, the kirk, of course, in Scotland, is very different from the church in England. The kirk is Presbyterian, and there are many Presbyterians here in England, many too, many Puritans, many also who, I'm afraid, cling to the old popish ways, the Arminians, as they're called. And King Charles has incited suspicion by marrying a Catholic wife. Queen Henrietta Maria, a daughter of Henry IV of France, our former ally. And this quarrel, which has now swelled to bring these armies into this very narrow cockpit, began quite early in his reign. The king, you see, was anxious to import into Scotland his Book of Common Prayer. Now, the Book of Common Prayer, Lord's Liturgy, as we call it, from Archbishop Lord, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury and the king's right-hand man and probably one of his more evil, evil counsellors. He believes that Scotland should also have an Episcopalian system. Bishops. Oh, bishops are an anathema to us, Scots. The Kirk is far more simple, far more, far more open to be uh, run, to be managed by the ordinary people. Uh, perhaps less tolerant to the English church, but nonetheless, they'll not have bishops. No, at all. There's one thing worse than bishops, it was the act of a scissory. Now the king, on coming into his own, could pass legislation, as did his father, which could claw back many land grants made in the last century. Now this wouldn't suit the church at all because many Catholic lands had passed into the hands of the Kirk and the Kirk would not be too keen to pass them back. If you want to attack a Scotsman, well, hit him first on his faith, but secondly, on his purse, and you'll find he may react quite sharply. And so, indeed, we did. Thousands of us flocked to sign the Solemn League and Covenant, a band. We like our bands, we like our covenants, whereby every man and woman, by implication, in Scotland, voted and wrote down their names, saying that they would defend the church against this creeping tide of Puritanism, or popery, whichever it was, not too keen on either. Uh, the king, advised by evil counsellors, proposed that instead of taking notice of these concerns of his Scottish subjects, would in fact enforce his will by the point of the sword. Now that's something, the point of the sword, uh, which we Scots generally understand quite well. Now I myself, perhaps rather advanced in years for commanding an army, Nonetheless, won my spurs and my titles and my not inconsiderable fortune, fighting for the great King Gustavus Adolphus in the wars in Europe. I, many of my officers, many indeed of the rank and file, had cut their teeth in these foreign wars. 
So we were not unprepared to take up arms in defence of our faith and in defence of our wallets if we had to. We have a system which you would call conscription, whereby every county, every shire, every community is obliged to provide uh, detachments and regiments to serve in the Commonweal. And at their own expense to equip these men in good, plain, hot and grey, such as I wear myself, and also with their pikes and their muskets. Now, the problem is that Scotland is a poor country, so we have less muskets per regiment than the English. But our men are well versed in the use of the pike. Uh, indeed, the spear, the long spear, was the common weapon of Scots for many generations. And many battles we fought against the English with our long spears. We lost them all, to be sure, but nonetheless, they do say that practice makes perfect. And in this instance, we are far better provided than the King's army. My Lord Conway, uh, who stands below me on Stella Hoff, has perhaps 3,000 foot soldiers and perhaps 2,500 cavalry in total, not all of whom are on the field. His men are of the lowest sort, scum dragged from the gutters and from alehouses. Why, I am told by my spies, he had to shoot five of his own men upon the town moor in Newcastle but a few weeks ago, as we French would say, or the French would say, pour encourager les autres. And I'm not sure they were that encouraged. Just after the signing of the covenant, the king attempted to assemble an army because the king had provoked parliament in England and only parliament could vote the taxation enough to raise an army. So the king, on the advice of another evil councillor, like Anne Stratford, decided to recall parliament. But this parliament was not very amenable. Mr. Pym, the leader of the parliamentary opposition, was quite vociferous that if monies were to be voted to the king to uh, pursue wars, of which the parliament did not really approve, then there would have to be significant concessions in relation to the royal prerogative. The king was no king. And once again, he provoked parliament and tried on his own to raise an army. Well, that didn't go too well. His army was a joke. Ours was not. By the pacification, as it's called in Barrack, last year, we came to terms. Well, we came to a truce. Everybody knew the business would begin again this year. And so it has. And so we were prepared. The estates prevailed upon me to take command of the army as their senior general. They also provided me with this full array of fighting men. Maybe we have 18,000 foot, and perhaps 3,000 cavalry, and a full complement of guns under an extremely able officer, my master of ordnance, Sandy Hamilton, served with me in the foreign wars. On the 21st of August, my army crossed the River Tweed at Coldstream and entered Northumberland, coming down towards the town of Newcastle by Eglingham and Wooler, another weapon. Now this is no army such as these English have seen before. We do not pillage, we do not rape. What we take, we pay for, well, with promissory notes, obviously not the cash. The states do not furnish their soldiers with the cash. And it may be we emptied a few barriers and a few barns and drank every well dry, for it was uncommon hot this season. As we came close to Newcastle, my spies, uh, whom I have many, it told me that uh, the governor there, old Sir Jacob Astley, a man I know pretty well, and a doughty soldier, was no minded to let us pass through Newcastle and bade us be on our way. Well, I have no quarrel with him. My army has no quarrel with the king. We are here solely to present our great petition to his majesty, who now is at lies at York. So we must pass by Newcastle to walk to or march upon York. I withdrew my army westward along the north bank of the Tyne to Hedden Hill, overlooking the village of Newburn. Now below Newburn are the fords. There's a number of fords, it's one of which dates back to the days of the Romans. And the river, of course, being both silted up and tidal, my men could easily march across, where barely getting their shoes wet at the right time of day. Also, I now command the high ground of Newburn, while my Lord Conway has his men on the flat plain of Stella Hoff. He has made provision. One of his uh, engineers, a man called Lloyd, I think he's Scottish anyway, 
has built two forts, one on the east, one on the west, to protect the four crossings. The one on the east is the larger of the two and can hold 400 shot and several guns. But these are sconces, earth three darts hastily thrown up. Now, as over, we parley, we talk. If I can pass my army by, then I have no need to fight Conway. Uh, but I know from, again, from my spies, that Conway has received strict instructions from the king, from Strafford, his creature, that the Scots army should not be allowed to pass the river town. A delegation of us may be allowed to proceed on our own to the King of York. And yet, I'm an old dog and I feel a delegation of 20 thousand men listing with arms and ordnance is somehow more persuasive than a group of gentlemen on horseback. So, it seems that if we are to proceed, we must fight. Today is a Wednesday, 28th of August, a hot day. It is now noon. I have sent officers down to parley with Lord Conway, hoping to avoid the effusion of Christian blood, naturally. And neither of us wants to be the first to be responsible for firing that fatal shot. Because once an army is committed to battle, well then, it must be seen through to the end. And there it is, the river, flowing lazily in the afternoon. The tide has receded. The river is now at its lowest, which suits my purpose perfectly. I send one of my officers, a rather vainglorious fellow, down to the river to water his horse. He boasts that he would do so in sight of the English. Ah, you, you may have heard a shot. I fear his boasting was in vain. But his sacrifice is not, for already as he falls, I send my cavalry squadrons across the river to beat up the English quarters. The English reply. Their guns and their musketeers rattle forth most bravely from their redoubts, and I pull my men back and let the artillery, my guns, do the job. The ground rises steeply on this side, and I have lined every hedge with musketeers. I have converted the cottages into strongholds. I have my guns on the high ground. Indeed, if you look out, you'll see there's a battery dug in in front of the church, much to the annoyance of the minister, because I'm um, ashamed of the inconvenience, but hopefully they won't be. Oh. And so the guns thunder, I apologise for the noise. It is truly deafening. But just imagine, you are one of those poor souls in the redoubts down in the riverside. See the punishment which they are taking. And this will go on for several hours, whilst I, with my glass, just watch how well the English bear up this baptism of fire. I watch how a shell kills a score of men and scatters their limbs across the ground. It's all very distressing for their particular limb. And then they begin to break. A trickle from the rear. A trickle becomes a stream. A stream becomes a river. A river becomes a flood. And the infantry take to their heels. Now it's time to send my cavalry back. But they're more serious this time. But as they cross the river, my Scottish lifeguards are charged by Lord Wilmot's cavalry. These are brave fellows. These are the cream of the English army. Gentlemen on horseback. They will certainly not give ground easily. And so the fight eddies backwards and forwards along the river bank. My men can make no real progress against the English cavaliers. Meanwhile, I've switched the guns to bombard the more westerly fort, and very soon the men there are in flight, just the same as their followers in the east. The cavalry fight continues. The English hold their ground. I will not deny them that. But now I can move my infantry up across the river, taking their light leather guns with them. And they're enfiladed on both flanks by regular bodies from my shop. The cavalry must now give ground. Many cavaliers fall. The rest rally and come on again, because their flanks are protected to some extent by hedges. I must admire my Lord Wilmot, uh, although, of course, he is now my captive, as indeed is Sir John Digby. The cavalry do not break, but retreat. In good order, I have to say. They make off towards Durham, I believe. The infantry, the English infantry, have scattered from the field. Many have abandoned their equipment, much loot for our fellows to pick up. Conway himself, I believe, will not try to hold Newcastle. Even now, Sir Jacob Astley is sending out emissaries to treat with me for the surrender of the town. Now, here's a turn up for the books, eh? At no time during the many long wars between England and Scotland did any Scots army succeed in taking Newcastle. They all failed. 
At least two kings of Scotland left their bones in England. And Anna, William the Lion, and David the Second both became captive. Every army we ever sent south was defeated. But not now. Today, 20th of August, 1640, I have won a notable victory. And the road to York, should I go down it, lies open. But maybe I do not need to. I hold Newcastle, the king's jewel in the north. And Newcastle is the centre of the English coal trade. I should know. I have shares in their ventures myself. But Sir Jacob and I are all drinking partners. So I'm sure that we will come to some arrangement. And His Majesty will meet our expenses for the time that we spend here. I estimate our expenses will be something in the order of 200,000 pounds and counting. It may interest you to know that when my officers, before we crossed the Tweed, diced as they did, who should have the honour of leading the vanguard? The officer who was successful was James Graham. That's rather strange, mercurial young man. He was the Marquis of Montrose, and he had the honour of leading my vanguard across the Tweed. And yet I fancy we have not yet heard the last of the Marquis of Montrose. His loyalty to the crown stakes deep, and he's no lover of our great leader, the Duke of Argyle. To tell you the truth. Neither am I. But this, what we have achieved today, is just one chapter in a story. And that story will continue. And I fear it will go ill with both kingdoms.